In the midst of the coronavirus crisis, a new job creation scheme was developed, providing ex-Labour MPs and failed advisers alongside far-right adjacent tabloid journalists and disgraced Home Secretaries a second chance in public life. Yes, the Murdoch-funded Times Radio has been streaming for just over a week now. Boris Johnson and Keir Starmer have already appeared. And on Sunday, Shadow Foreign Secretary Lisa Nandy dropped in to speak to former Labour MP for Ashfield, Gloria De Piero, and fashion adjacent son or ex-political editor at The Sun, Tom Newton Dunn. Let's take a look at how that conversation played out. There's been lots of research on what happened uh, to the Labour vote. Um, Lord Ashcroft did a report, but also Labour together. Um, they concluded something very similar. Uh, I'm quoting from the Labour Together report now. The Labour Party seemed not to understand ordinary working people to disdain what they considered mainstream views. And, you know, you might say the Labour Party is in in favour of every form of diversity except diversity of thought. So I want to I want to ask you, if you want to get different people involved in the party, maybe even different representatives, would somebody be welcome in, in Labour if, for example, they, they favoured more stringent rules on who receives state benefits? Um, yes, I think so, because I've, we've had those debates within CLPs that I've been part of, my own CLP in Wigan. We, you know, we debate these issues, not because we don't like people on benefits, but because we think, because working class people, as one woman said to me in the run up to the 2015 election, it's our money, love, don't spend it all. We haven't got a lot of it. Um, and it's one of the reasons, actually, that I was watching the TV this morning and I saw Annalisa Dodds out talking about how we want more flexibility in the furlough scheme to protect workers in industries that are really struggling. And she said, I want to be really clear that we're not saying that the furlough scheme goes on forever because these things cost money and it's important to, to be mindful of how you spend people's money. I mean, I, you know, I think there is I think there is has been a, a huge journey in Labour, actually, about some of that. And we've always had debates around these issues. We don't demonise people on benefits and we don't blame them for the problems in our society. But we do have debates about how the benefit system should work. So that was Lisa Nandy talking to Gloria De Piero. Um, Tom Newton Dunn didn't speak uh, in that clip. Um, there she was quoting the Labour Together report. We did a whole show on that. Um, I actually think the report was pretty good. I think it's a pretty good sort of point to to draw consensus around within the Labour Party. It doesn't advocate a shift to the right on economic policy. Um, that quote again that she read out, the Labour Party seemed not to understand ordinary working people to disdain what they consider mainstream views. Um, uh, now, I mean, you, you can debate about the pros and you know, or, the, or the truth or falsity of that particular statement. But what's relevant, I think, here is what Gloria De Piero translates ordinary working people to mean. So the first thing she jumps to is that ordinary working people, they want to cut benefits. Ordinary working people, what, what, what do they want? They think Labour is too kind to people on benefits. Um, that's why they didn't vote for them. They felt like they were treated with disdain. I mean... One of the things that's really interesting there is she said, maybe Labour could even have some representatives who think that benefits should be reduced. Now, the majority of the PLP in 2015 abstained on the welfare bill. So the majority of the PLP have in recent history signed up to the idea that there should be a benefit cap and it should be harder to claim benefits. This is not the kind of thing that is taboo in the Labour Party. And that, you know, imagine, imagine if the Labour Party got an MP who believed in reducing the rights that people have to claim benefits. They have loads of MPs who believe that. Um, broader though, in terms of Lisa Nani's argument, I mean, I agree that obviously people should be welcome as Labour Party members if they think that benefits should be made more stringent. I think at the same time though, you should be able to say as a Labour Party representative, as a member of the Shadow Cabinet, Yes, of course. Of, of course, that's not an opinion that's beyond the pale and these people are welcome in, in the Labour Party. But we as a party have a very strong position on this, which is that right now in this country, eligibility for benefits has been clawed back to such an extreme extent that the idea that we should reduce it any further is, is ridiculous. It's for the birds. It would be obscene to do so. And we have been very clear over the last five years that none of the problems affecting this country because of people on benefits, it would be economically catastrophic to further reduce them. And what we as the Labour Party want to do is create a more you know, generous or sympathetic or solidaristic welfare 
system. And uh, uh, there's sort of a, there's a bit of a problem here, I think, in terms of finding a register to speak, which is neither judgmental and dismissive of people that disagree with you, but also not completely apologetic about your beliefs. And I think, you know, different wings in Labour have sort of flipped between those two and haven't quite found a way to be proud of your opinions whilst not excluding people who don't necessarily share them wholesale. Aaron, what did you make of that interaction? Well, I mean, Gloria De Piero has got the job she has at Times Radio precisely to make these points. You know, clearly a political party has to have a certain minimal programme around which it agrees. It clearly has to have a set of values around which it agrees. Imagine if we had a, you and I on Tiski Sauer were interviewing a Conservative Party MP and we said, what if somebody wants to socialise the means of production? Would they not be welcome in the Conservative Party? What if somebody wanted to nationalise the entirety of privately owned property and get rid of landlords? Would, would you not be willing to accept that person as a Conservative Party member? Of course they wouldn't. That's ridiculous. It's the complete opposite of what the Conservative Party stands for, the interests it's meant to represent, the values upon which it was founded. You know, Labour is almost unique in this bizarre self-flagellation it does that it performs uh, the public. And I don't think it's accidental that this happens. You can earn a very good wage being a lefty or a former Labour MP or a, a Labour supporter while doing nothing but disparaging the Labour Party. Nick Cohen, uh, Gloria De Piero here, Aisha Hazarik, I could, I could name dozens of them, the entire staff effects of the Observer newspaper. So uh, I don't think it's a surprise that she's making the argument she's making here on The Times. It's effectively that political function that she's fulfilling there. Furthermore, you know, we've got 9.1 million people in this country right now on furlough. 9.1 million people getting their wages paid for by the government. You know, in that context, it really shows the extent to which Gloria De Piero, former morning TV, she ch morning TV chat show host and then MP, the extent to which she is detached from ordinary people. Maybe before December when she was an MP, that wasn't the case. But right now, when 9 million people are on furlough, to be talking about reducing state benefits is it's nuts. Not even the Tories are going to do that. So I, I, I kind of think it probably does show a certain detachment from where she presently is. Probably the major benefit of having Jeremy Corbyn as leader of the Labour Party was that instead of following public opinion, the Labour Party started making it, shifting it. Um, and there is actually no better example of them doing this than on benefits. They didn't just say, oh, these people don't like benefits, so let's you know, attack benefit claimants. They said, let's change the narrative on this. Um, and the evidence shows they were actually very successful. So these are both um, data from the National Social Attitudes Surveys, um, sort of put together in a graphic by The Economist. And so this is showing you the, the number of people who thought that welfare benefits were too generous versus the number of people who thought that cuts would damage too many people's lives. And you can see that all the way from uh, 2006 to 2015, the number who think it's too generous, way higher than the number of people who think that cuts would damage too many people's lives. You've got a population there who wants to make benefits more stingy, as it were. What happens in 2015? Jeremy Corbyn becomes leader of the Labour Party. The number of people who thinks cuts would damage too many people's lives goes from fifth, goes from about 46% to 56%, jumps 10 points in two years. And the number of people who think that welfare benefits are too generous goes down from just over 50%, so 52% to about 40 three percent again by about 10 points and you could say oh well maybe maybe that was because there were benefit cuts in that period of time you'd had five years of austerity by 2015 and ed miliband because you know all, all, i quite like the guy but i think his leadership of the party was fairly disastrous and one of the reasons it was is because what the labor party did was they chased they chased public opinion and that meant that even though we were seeing the most brutal most you know nonsensical cuts to benefits of the people that are most vulnerable in society, the public still thought that benefits were too generous until someone came along who dared to say, who dared to say, actually, this is bullshit, right? Corbyn did that and public opinion changed. I wanna get this next graph up before I go to you, Aaron. Um, so one of the ways this sort of fed back um, into, or I suppose one of the ways is the mechanism here is that it got mentioned fewer and fewer times in the press. So it stopped dominating media narratives. We've got the number of phrases related to welfare fraud and abuse in newspapers. Um, and that goes from uh, above 600 to down to 200. I should have checked what this is per, to be honest. Um, but what you can see is that it tumbles from being at a very high level in 2015 to very low by 20. 
18. And so not only can you change public opinion, you can also change what journalists write about. If you remember the headlines in 2014, 2015, which was all about benefit cheats, people cheating the state, someone has seven kids and got benefits for a house that's worth X number of money, you know, bullshit stuff, right? The reason that changed wasn't because a new person bought the sun. It's still Murdoch. It wasn't because a new person got the editorship at the, the Daily Mail. It was the same guy right up until last year. It's because a politician came along who was willing to call bullshit. He did it. And politics still has changed. I think. And, and that's something that Gloria De Piero in that, and, and Lisa Nandy, to be fair, do not recognise. Changing attitudes from 2001, uh, there's falling support for benefits. There's increased support for cuts to benefits. Labour were in power from 1997 to 2010. Uh, so it was under Labour that actually a culture of attacking and lambasting uh, and almost so often a sort of protein hatred towards people on, on benefits was actually cultivated. And it's something that Labour played along with. They second-guessed this fictional public, this fictional electorate, uh, which, by the way, they were losing. You know, it was during this period that Labour loses five million votes. Uh, and what they did was help toxify the, the broader political debate. And I think a lot of younger people now, they go, oh, Tony Blair was wonderful. Well, if you think somebody's wonderful who uh, finds torture... Um, extraordinary rendition, illegal war. If you think that's all okay, then you go knock yourself out. But I think on the domestic front, just as bad was that New Labour didn't just not make the argument for a bigger state, for higher taxation, for social justice. They didn't just not do that, because of course it was financed through financialization, tax receipts from the City of London, PFI. Uh, I think they actually did something worse, which is actually they denigrated uh, and vilified working people in this country, as, as Owen Jones, a friend of the show, so articulately highlights in his book, Chavs. And I think that's something to, to really think about. You know, Labour on both sides of the debate shaped it here. Under Blair and Brown, uh, working people on benefits were increasingly hatred, uh, incre increasingly hated, increasingly disparaged. Under Jeremy Corbyn, that changed. Now, the question for Keir Starmer is: This is somebody who said, "This is someone who says, as a politician, I'm about winning power." Tony Blair won power, but he also lost the debate. And I do wonder, Keir Starmer, by the way, I don't think will be prime minister. But even if he is, you know, would we see a repeat of the trend that we see under Tony Blair? Because what the left has to understand in this country is, it's not just a, a battle at the ballot box. It's also a battle for public opinion, for ideas, for consensus. And unless that's shifted, actually, Labour can't do very much. And so I, I think, yes, it tells us thing about Jeremy Corbyn, but there's a lesson there for Keir Starmer about the changes under both Blair and Brown uh, and the, the decreases in consent for an extensive welfare state. We're going to go straight into the next part of that clip with Lisa Nandy and Gloria De Piero. Let's take a look. Could you attend a Labour Party meeting with a copy of the Daily Mail under your arm? Would you be welcomed? Well, yeah, I think I think you would be welcomed. I mean, people turn up with the Wigan Evening Post generally to ours, which sort of begs the question as to how interesting could, could the meetings you be pro -life? are. People could are you, bringing the paper. Could, could you be pro-life? Uh, yes, so, so I'm pro-choice myself, but a lot of my party members are pro-life. This is a very Catholic constituency. Uh, I thought that second answer was quite good. Yes, I'm pro-life. No, sorry, I'm pro-choice, but of course you can be pro-life. I don't mm. know why she didn't give a similarly confident answer when it came to benefit cuts, probably because she's not so confident in her opinion there. I think Lisa Nandy did abstain on the welfare bill, but we're going to focus on the Daily Mail point. And um, so Gloria De Piero is, again, before she was sort of identifying ordinary working people with people who want benefits to be cut, I don't know what evidence there is for that. Now she's saying ordinary working people are those people who read the Daily Mail, um, which isn't really borne out in the evidence. Let's take a look at the demographics of who does read the Daily Mail. So this is from um, the the Daily Mail's own, this is from Metro Classifieds. This is them advertising or them, them telling advertisers why they should advertise in the Daily Mail. Um, and their big takeaway is the Daily Mail provides advertisers with unrivaled reach of a predominantly cash-rich, time-rich audience. Cash-rich, time-rich. <laughs> this isn't necessarily orderly, ordinary working people. Time rich because they don't work, which is, you know, these people on pensions, fine. Um, cash rich because they've got quite a lot of money, right? So, so uh, how this translates to ordinary working people is, obviously we want these people to vote Labour if they, if they want to, fine. Um, I want to go now to the, a bit more, some more statistics. So 83% of Daily Mail readers are homeowners. 70% um, of them own their home outright. So that's people who aren't even paying a mortgage anymore. 
Um, 62% are from A, B, C, 1. So that's the professional classes um, in uh, the traditional methods by for looking at um, class background. And then half a million of them have savings and investments of £100,000 or more. Um, so, you know... It's uh, the idea that the people who read the Daily Mail are sort of like Britain's forgotten classes that the Labour Party denigrate because they're classist snobs, I don't think holds that much water. Um, and obviously the other factor here is age. Let's bring up um, the average ages of people who read the Daily Mail. So the Daily Mail, you've got 45% of people are over 65. Again, Labour needs pensioners to vote for them, but let's say pensioners, not ordinary working people, um, whereas the, the Guardian has 21% only 9% of people who read the mail are under 24, 14%, or if you add those two up, 23% under 34. So you can see, and this is not to say, oh, Labour, we don't need pensioners. Obviously, Labour needs pensioners to vote for us. But this idea that ordinary working people means retired white people who own their homes, like, fine, maybe that's a significant demographic that Labour needs to win. But for them to stand in for ordinary working people, there's something else going on there, isn't there? But that, that's what she means, Michael. I mean, they're viewed as commensurate in her imagination. You know, th this white, affluent, you know, mortgage owner uh, is, you know, I, I, and also a really critical thing is, and we're not a huge fan, fans of this kind of barbarian typology of, of careers, ABC ones are the people who enjoy autonomy at work. You like to say it's sort of managerial, professional class. C2Ds are people in, you know, retail cashiers or, um, you know, warehousing, logistics, and so on. So by any measure, this is the more affluent, more privileged part of British society. And you're absolutely right. Labour needs to win these people. That's not to say they, they don't. But you, you want to win these people over. The Daily Mail is now Britain's most read newspaper. I mean, that, those statistics are slightly out. Its readership in the context of coronavirus is just below a million. But still, that's in the context of coronavirus, right? There's a huge readership. It's now more widely read than the, than the sun. What was really revealing about that whole moment there was that sort of Tom Newton Dunn, um, slimy as he is, she said, would somebody be welcome if they were reading that? He goes, Tom Newton Dunn went to Eton. Okay, so Tom Newton Dunn is the kind of the the tribune of Britain's working class because he was a political editor to the sun. No, he went to Eton. Uh, I think it's really important here as well to say, you know, young people are reading the FT as well as The Guardian, right? We're talking about people in work. Labour, even under Jeremy Corbyn, was doing very well with people in work. But we had this weird phenomenon where people who have to work for a living no longer constitute the working class. Why? Because they tend to have more progressive attitudes. They tend to be renters, or they tend to be BAME, or they, they tend to want to get rid of things like student debt. So these categories automatically, existentially, ontologically, disqualify them from actually being the working class, even though under any economic understanding of what the working class actually is, they're the bedrock of it.